Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. He told me he regrets his life of violence, drugs, and alcohol. You think you might be able to stop in the future, you think you can be able to measure it and just do a little bit here and a little bit there, but you're looking at a bone, bona fide alcoholic and drug fanatic, and I can tell you that it's not, it's going to get worse, and uh, it's going to lead to violence and chaos. You could jeopardize losing your whole family. You could jeopardize your life. You could, you could end up like me. Robert Van Hook was born on January 14, 1960 in Sharonville, Ohio. His parents were in a relationship together, but their relationship was unhealthy. They were both heavily into drinking and would frequent bars. Robert was always allowed to drink and do drugs with his father because he had no issues giving it to him. He allowed Robert to experiment and would even take him on trips to bars. For Robert, the drinking and drug use did not stop, even though he tried to make an honest living by joining the military. He was able to enlist, but was eventually kicked out of the military because of his drug use. Another thing Robert struggled with besides drinking and using drugs was his sexuality. Robert admitted that he started robbing gay men at the age of 15. After getting out of the military, he went right back to robbing gay men. The victims would always think that they would be able to get some form of sex with Robert before they were victimized. On February 18, 1985, Robert chose to head out that evening to downtown Cincinnati where the nightlife in the gay scene was buzzing. He made it to the subway bar and he set his eyes on a man by the name of David Self. When Robert approached David at the bar, David seemed interested in Robert and the two began to drink and talk for a total of three hours. The two were friendly with the bartender, so when it was time for the pair to go to David's house for a sexual encounter, David let the bartender know he was leaving and where they were going. After making it to David's apartment, Robert and David started to get intimate. David was put into a position that was compromising, and that is when something switched in Robert and he decided to attack David. The attack did not stop there, and he looked for a weapon in David's house in order to kill him. Some of David's wounds exposed internal cavities, and when Robert was done with his attack, he shoved a small bottle, a cigarette butt, and a weapon into the cavity. After going overboard with David's body, he then ransacked David's apartment looking for anything of value. He was able to find a chest full of jewelry which contained the gold chain David had worn to the bar that night. Building up an appetite, he then searched David's fridge to see if there was something he could eat, but there was nothing to his liking, so he left. Instead of going home, Robert drove to his friend Dr. Robert Hoy's house. Robert Hoy was a family friend and asked Robert what had happened. He expressed to his friend that he got into a fight with his stepfather and asked if he could borrow some money and eat some food. Robert Hoy made him a large meal and gave him money. When Robert was done eating, he drove all the way to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Robert was able to fly under the radar up until April 1, 1985, when Oakland Park Police in Florida apprehended him. He was later indicted on April 18th, exactly one month after killing David, on one count of aggravated murder by a Hamilton County grand jury. His indictment carried a death penalty specification because of the aggravated robbery. On April 23rd, Robert pled not guilty by reason of insanity, so there was an automatic court-ordered psychiatric evaluation. He claimed to have gone into a homosexual panic and could not control his behavior. He had been fighting his true feelings and would take it out on any gay man who found him attractive or wanted to do anything sexual with him. He was found competent to stand trial and waived his rights to a jury trial, so his trial was held in front of a three-judge panel. Robert's trial began on July 15, 1985, and he was found guilty by the judges on July 29, 1985. His death sentence came on August 8. There were immediate appeals, and Robert's first appeal had eight points of error, with one of them being that the incriminating statements he made to Cincinnati law enforcement should not have been allowed during trial because they were involuntary and should have been suppressed. 
In a quote from his appeal, he claimed that police ignored his attempt to invoke his constitutional rights and used psychological ploys, including employing his mother to assist them, to induce him to incriminate himself. The response to this argument was that Robert raised no procedural default arguments against that claim. In 2017, there were a few attorneys in the state of Ohio who tried to stop an execution because the inmate they were representing had a reaction to the lethal drugs, but every time they tried to get a hold of someone at the prison, they were unsuccessful. Because of this, Judge Michael Murs permitted a new system to be created that allowed open phone lines from the execution room to the courtroom. On July 18, 2018, which was Robert's execution day, he arrived at Lucasville Prison and had a final meal of french fries, cheeseburgers, strawberry cheesecake with whipped cream on top, a vanilla milkshake, and some grapefruit juice. After being taken to his execution room, a federal judge allowed an open phone line for the courtroom. Robert Van Hook was officially pronounced dead at 1044 on a Wednesday on July 18, 2018. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Execution. Let me know what you guys think much, about this story in the comments below. Every day, every day in my life. I pray for him every day and I pray for a lot of things. Do you ever think about what's going to be going through your mind when it's you who's being led away? I'm going to be thinking about my brothers here on death row, what, how they're going to be feeling, you know, losing me. So that's probably what I'll be thinking going, because I have no fear of death, you know. Uh, in a way, I kind of look forward to it because for me, it'd be like starting a new life again. He may not fear death, but he has fought it for decades. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Death Row Executions. Today's video will be on two people who were sentenced to death and later found to be innocent. For 37 years, Robert Dubois has proclaimed his innocence behind prison walls, even during the verdict decades ago. You don't know how tough it is. But now DNA evidence proves he was telling the truth the whole time. Today, Robert's conviction has been vacated, and he can finally start to rebuild his life. As I said to the judge, I'm just very grateful for Mr. Warren and Ms. Hall working with Susan Friedman. I mean, that's amazing in itself. You never find a prosecutor's office that works with the defense, ever. So it showed from day one that they only sought the truth. It all started back on August 19, 1983, in Tampa Heights, Florida. It was around 8 o'clock in the morning when 19-year-old Barbara Grams was found dead outside of a dentist office. Authorities were called to the scene and her case was considered a homicide because she was found with nothing on except for a tube top that had been pulled down, leaving her body exposed. By the looks of her face and body, it appeared that she was physically assaulted. Lead investigator, Detective Phillips Saladino, also noticed that one of Barbara's fingers had a ring mark on it, but the ring was missing. Barbara was a hard-working young woman, and she worked just two miles away from where she was killed at the Hot Potato Restaurant at the local shopping mall. Detectives spoke with her co-workers, and one co-worker let them know that Barbara closed the restaurant the night before at 9 o'clock p.m., and typically after she closes, she would walk home by herself because it wasn't a far walk to get to her house. Two witnesses, who also happened to be Barbara's friends, told investigators that they saw Barbara walking on North Boulevard Street at 9.30 p.m., and by that time, she was only a few blocks away from her house, and it was also a location that was past the dentist's office where she was killed. It was speculated that maybe Barbara backtracked in order to purchase some cigarettes from a convenience store close by, but no one will ever know why she made the trek back. After more investigating in the area in which Barbara was killed, authorities found two 4x4s with Barbara's hair and DNA on it, so they believed those were the murder weapons. Detectives also ended up taking fingerprints from an air conditioning unit by the crime scene, 
and they also took fingerprints of Barbara's wallet. The autopsy on Barbara's body was conducted on August 20th by Dr. Lee Miller, and the autopsy concluded that there was, in his words, white fluid in her vaginal samples. He also noticed a bite mark on her cheek and took saliva samples and believed that the DNA was from her attacker. Dr. Miller then phoned a forensic odontologist by the name of Dr. Richard Powell. Although it was Dr. Powell's first criminal case, he examined the photos sent to him by Dr. Miller and he told Dr. Miller that the bite came from someone with missing upper front teeth. He also noted that the six lower teeth had no gaps. On August 23rd, Dr. Miller took a cheek sample and placed it in formaldehyde in order to get a clear look at the bite mark because the tissue would shrink 10% in size. While Dr. Miller was conducting his own test, Tampa police decided to reach out to a different dentist who was a forensic odontologist in other high-profile murder cases. This dentist, Dr. Richard Silveron, advised lead detective Saladino to use beeswax to make bite mark impressions of potential suspects and the molds could be used to compare to the picture of Barbara's cheek. The beeswax was easy to access because Detective Saladino's police captain was a beekeeper. Reports say that Detective Saladino and his partner made over 100 molds for potential suspects, but nothing turned up. Detective Saladino had multiple suspects despite the molds not matching. There was a man who dated Barbara and a neighbor who had sold Barbara diet pills, but the investigation led to a dead end. Finally, Detective Saladino got a lead when he spoke with a woman who worked at a convenience store near the dentist office Barbara was killed in front of. Although she did not recognize any photos of Barbara, she told the detective that there were men around the area that caused problems, a Ray, a Robert, and a Bo. She then directed him to a house nearby, but when Detective Saladino made it to the property, no one was home. They searched the mailbox and they saw mail addressed to multiple people with the last name Dubois. After more digging, they discovered the mail belonged to two brothers, Victor and Robert Dubois. They also found out that 18-year-old Robert already had two minor nonviolent crimes and was currently on probation. This was a lead for Detective Saladino and he eventually met up with Robert on September 25th. While being questioned, Robert said that he heard around town that police were taking bite marks of everyone but he had nothing to hide and was willing to give them an impression of his teeth. Robert's parents were also questioned, and they said Robert and Victor were home the night of August 18th, but if they did go out, it was to look for their sister Myra Dubois, who was reported missing on August 16th and later found. Detectives were still stuck on Robert being their main suspect, despite him not having gaps in his upper teeth. Also, despite Dr. Silveron himself saying the attacker had missing upper teeth, he reported to Detective Saladino on October 21st that Robert made the bite marks found on Barbara. On October 22nd, 1983, Detective Saladino asked Robert to come to the police station so they could talk. Robert, not knowing he was going to be arrested, waited in the police station for an hour before he was met by Detective Saladino, who then arrested him. It was 3.20 in the morning, and Robert was charged with murder and sexual assault. The very next day, another mold was taken of Robert's mouth, and Dr. Silveron confirmed Robert was the attacker. While Robert was locked up at the Hillsborough County Jail, Detective Saladino got another lead in January of 1984 after another inmate by the name of Claude Butler informed him that Robert Dubois admitted to him that he, his brother Victor, and another man named Raymond Garcia sexually assaulted Barbara and then killed her. Detective Saladino believed Claude because Robert and Claude both had psychiatric issues and were in a small section of the jail that was specifically for inmates who were suffering with mental health issues. Even though Claude told Detective Saladino that Robert admitted other men were involved in the murder, he decided not to charge anyone else except for Robert. Claude, who was facing murder charges, was sentenced to five years in prison for his crime, and some say he received a deal for being a witness against Robert, but all claims were denied. Another witness by the name of Joanne Suarez told investigators that Robert told her back in August of 1983 that he killed someone but did not give a name or a reason why. She also said that she saw Robert with a ring similar to the one Barbara used to wear. A third witness by the name of Jack told investigators that back when Barbara was murdered, he was living at the Peter Pan Motel and it was the same place Robert was before his arrest. Jack said that he saw Robert at a party and was visibly upset. 
He asked Robert what was the matter, and Robert responded to him by saying that he was upset because he was wanted for murder. Twelve days after Jack told investigators this story, Robert's trial in Hillsborough County Circuit Court began. It was February 25, 1985. When trial began, prosecutors led with witness testimonies and a storyline that Robert was a violent, raging man. I already mentioned that the first witness was given a light sentence after his cooperation with the police. The third witness, Jack, was a witness in another murder case going on, and after his witness testimony against Robert, he was not charged for his other murder case. Joanne could not testify much because she suffered from a brain injury and could not recall much during trial. The evidence prosecutors led with was the bite mark left on Barbara. Dr. Soveron spoke with the jury about the bite mark. Defense questioned Dr. Soveron about the statement he made to detectives that he eventually admitted to saying, If you tell me that this is the guy that did it, I will go in court and say that this guy is the guy that did it. Dr. Soveron admitted to saying this to detectives, and it made it seem like the teeth composites truly weren't a match and he was going with whoever detectives wanted to frame as their suspect. Defense then brought in their own forensic expert, Dr. Norman Sperber, who testified that Robert should be excluded as the source of the bite mark and he should be innocent altogether because no forensic evidence tied him to the murder of Barbara. None of the fingerprints taken near the crime scene belonged to Robert or anyone he knew. Detective Saladino took to the stand and swore that he had never seen Robert before. It turned out that that statement was a lie because he was a part of a sting operation that arrested Robert in the past for burglary. Robert was eventually found guilty of capital murder and attempted sexual assault on March 7, 1985. The jury came back with a recommendation of life in prison, but Judge Harry Lee Coe III decided to go against the jury recommendation and he sentenced Robert to death by method of the electric chair. Robert spent a horrific 35 years on death row and had to deal with numerous appeals being denied. In some appeals, they claimed that the cast of his teeth were based on an illegal search and that Claus should not have been able to testify against him in court because he was acting as an agent for the state. They also claimed that the judge abused his discretion when he overruled the jury's recommendation of life in prison. The Florida Supreme Court said it did not matter that the beeswax molds that were initially taken were not scientifically reliable because there were more casts made after his arrest that were valid and he consented to the procedures. Robert said that he was heavily medicated on antipsychotic medication at the time he consented and he was not in his right frame of mind. The appeal court upheld Robert's conviction, but they did rule that the trial judge did not give a proper regard to the jury's sentence recommendation and Robert's sentence was changed to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years. In 2006, Robert requested post-conviction DNA testing, but all of the DNA evidence from his case was destroyed in 1990, and the court refused his request to test other items of evidence from his case. The court said that because he committed the murder with other people, any evidence missing would not necessarily prove his innocence. In 2018, when the Innocence Project started to investigate Robert's case, they discovered that the inmate who gave testimony against Robert, Claude Butler, his five-year prison sentence was reduced to time served and he only spent a total of 13 months in prison. The Innocence Project then looked into State Attorney Ober, who testified in court. He was quoted saying, We made no promises to Claude. We did nothing for him. He asked nothing. So the Innocence Project found out that Attorney Ober lied under oath. He also claimed he never met with Claude Butler, but in actuality, they did meet before trial. This new evidence was turned in during an appeal on September 26, 2019, and the courts agreed to review Robert's case. In this new investigation, the National Academy of Science said that there was no scientific foundation to support the idea that human bite marks are unique or that skin is capable of faithfully recording those marks. Forensic odontology during the time Robert was originally investigated had since been discredited and no longer accepted as reasonable medical dental certainty. In 2019, Dr. Silveron recanted his testimony he gave for the prosecution during trial. A new doctor, Dr. Adam Freeman, explained that when the cheek tissue was placed in formaldehyde, it made the tissue sample ill-suited for comparisons and that the beeswax mold left distorted impressions. He also testified that the mark on Barbara's cheek was not even a bite mark at all. 
so it was pointless to take any molds of anyone's teeth. In August of 2020, a supervising attorney by the name of Teresa Hall was able to find three slides from the sexual assault kit taken on Barbara that contained DNA samples. The DNA samples were retested and Robert was excluded as a contributor. His brother Victor was also excluded and the other suspect, Raymond Garcia, was excluded as a contributor as well. On August 26, 2020, there was a motion to reduce Robert's sentence to time served and he was released from Hardy Correctional Institute that same day. Dr. Richard Silveron refused to give an interview, but on September 14, 2020, he did agree to give a statement to the Tampa Bay Times and he said, there could have been a million other people whose teeth fit. What a ding dong. In October of 2021, Robert filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city of Tampa, Dr. Silveron, and all of the police officers involved in his case. On August 4, 2022, Amos Robinson and Abraham Scott were indicted on murder charges of Barbara Grahams and Linda Lanson. Their DNA matched the DNA that was found on both women and in the DNA evidence collected against Robert for his case. I used to watch your Breaking Bond segment, etc. You know, there's a lot of mention about uh, 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 about the repeat offenders, but I mean, I never hear you talking anything about the rights of uh, of the citizens. Once again, uh, Ed Gonzalez, Harris County Sheriff. Uh, today at 4:01 p.m., the Harris County Sheriff's Office lost one of its own. There's simply no. Yes, I had a head turns, but those head turns is good for me. And I say, hey, how, how are you? You have a question? Now, so it will give me the chance to open up the conversation. He's gonna be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> pretty good. <laughs> I'm not getting him out. Yeah! Oh, Come on, give me a hug. Sandeep Singh Dhaliwal was born in America in the year 1977. His family practiced Sikhism and religion was a big part of his life. He wore a turban out in public, and although he and his family faced discrimination at times, he remained proud to be an American and proud to express his identity. Sandeep owned a trucking business, but an unfortunate encounter with the law made him leave his business to join the force and make a difference. One winter day in the year 2008, Sandeep was sitting in a crowd at his place of worship. He witnessed an encounter between a Sikh family and Harris County law enforcement. This family had actually been the ones to call for police in order to report a burglary, but when police arrived and noticed their traditional attire, witnesses noticed that the family was being treated as if they were the criminals and not the callers who reported the crime. This event led the newly elected Harris County Sheriff, Adrian Garcia, to make an apology and to make an oath to make things right with law enforcement and the Sikh community. He made the effort to learn about their culture and visited a Gurdwara, which is the name for the Sikh's place of worship. When I was sitting in the congregation like I was sitting today, hearing Sheriff Garcia talking about it, I think he was here to make up, give a community a hope. After these series of events, Sandeep told his father that he wanted to join the Sheriff's Department. Many of Sandeep's family members thought it was not the best decision, but Sandeep followed his heart and ended up becoming the first Sikh to become a deputy at the Houston Area Sheriff's Department when he joined the force the following year in 2009. I do have a concern when he's out with the turban, but I pray for God and uh, I hope we educate people about them. Sandeep had been working for a few years, but without his turbans. It wasn't until 2015 he was granted permission to wear his turban and beard as part of his uniform. This made headline news, and he was a role model to many Sikhs around the world who wanted to pursue a career in law enforcement. One of Sandeep's co-workers was quoted saying, Sandeep wanted to show that a Sikh person with a turban is a symbol of someone who's there to provide service, to provide help whenever you need it. Sandeep's father, P.R. Singh Dhaliwal, was scared for his son's safety when interacting with people in the community. He pushed for Sandeep to become a sergeant, and Sandeep actually passed the exam to become a sergeant, but he told his father, I don't want to sit in the office. I don't want to be a sergeant. Maybe next year. Things were going well for Sandeep. He was married and had three children. Ten years on the force, Sandeep was a respected deputy in the community. 
things would change for him on September 27, 2019. Believe it or not, I mean, I have not had any negative interaction so far. Tomorrow, I don't know. At around 12.20 p.m., Sandeep was making a routine traffic stop and he ended up pulling over a man named Robert Solis. Sandeep was unaware of the fact that Robert was a convicted felon and that he had an active parole violation warrant for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon dating all the way back from 2017. Sandeep called dispatch at 12.23 p.m. and three minutes later at 12.26 p.m., the dispatcher checked in with him. Sandeep updated his situation and said that everything was fine. In a matter of minutes, Sandeep was fatally shot and Robert was on the run. Major Mike Lee of the Houston County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene of the crime and he was able to go through Sandeep's dash cam video footage. Major Mike Lee was able to see that when Sandeep was speaking with Robert, he was on the driver's side and the driver door was completely opened when he was speaking with Robert. From the looks of the video, the men were having a conversation and there was nothing aggressive or off about the conversation. Deputy Sandeep ended up shutting the driver door and started walking back to his patrol car. In a matter of seconds, Robert opened the driver door, hopped out, began running towards Sandeep from behind, aiming a gun straight at him, and when he was close enough, he fired. Sandeep never saw it coming. He was rushed to the hospital, but succumbed to his gunshot wounds to the head. Robert Solis had a big rap sheet and had been getting into trouble for a long time. Authorities believe that he knew he was going back to jail and in an attempt to avoid going back to prison, he killed Sandeep. Born in 1972, 47-year-old Robert was on the run. A neighbor who lived a few houses down from where the traffic stop took place witnessed the actual traffic stop, heard the two gunshots go off, and saw Robert running from the scene of the crime and then getting into a getaway car, fleeing the scene. She immediately called 911 and ran over to check on Deputy Sandeep. After Major Mike Lee and other officers arrived at the scene of the crime and went through the dash cam video, they took a still image from the video to distribute an image of the suspect they were looking for. Well, Mr. Solis, please proceed with your opening statement. It was not long before Robert Solis was found a quarter of a mile away from the scene of the crime at a nearby business. Although arresting officers noticed Robert appeared to be nervous, he was arrested without incident. Police began searching for the murder weapon and they ended up finding it in the parking lot of the business he was hiding out in. After some more digging into Robert Solis's past, they found out that his arrest record was extensive. Robert became a father in 1998. It is not clear if this was his first child or not, but one day, in order to prevent himself from being captured by police for shooting a man, Robert kept his little one for leverage and protection. SWAT team arrived on the scene and convinced him to release the hostage, which was his own flesh and blood. Harris County court records show that he was released from prison back in 2014, but he had never served his full sentence. He was initially sent to prison in 2002, and was sentenced to 29 years in prison. This means that Robert only served 12 years out of his 29-year sentence. A couple of years after his release from prison in 2014, Robert was busted for drunk driving. Although he violated his parole, the parole board decided to give him a chance and did not make him report back to prison. He paid his $5,000 bond and was set free. In 2017, Robert got into a one-sided altercation with his significant other, Melissa, and because he was charged with aggravated assault and weapon possession, there was a warrant out for his arrest, but he was able to avoid being caught until his arrest for the murder of Sandeep. Robert Solis was indicted on capital murder charges in December of 2019. He fired his court-appointed lawyers and decided to represent himself during trial. While on the witness stand, Robert admitted to killing Deputy Sandeep. He then proceeded to tell the court, I stand before you an innocent man. I believe I'll be able to show I had no intention of killing this man. He then said that everything was a blur and reiterated that he did not intend to kill Sandeep. The jury did not buy how he did not intend to kill Sandeep when the gunshot wound was directly positioned in the back of his head. At the conclusion of trial, the jury deliberated for about 30 minutes and they found Robert Solis guilty of capital murder on Monday, October 17, 2022. Since you found me guilty, Careful, 
After Robert's sentencing, Harris County Sheriff Ed Gonzalez was quoted saying, Sandeep changed our sheriff's office family for the better, and we continue striving to live up to his example of servant leadership. May he rest in peace. Hello everyone, today's story is on serial killer Bobby Joe Long, who was executed in the state of Florida for killing 10 people within 8 months. A lot of lives just got right down the tubes because of me, you know, in one way or another. And it's not a good feeling, it's not a pleasant feeling, I'm not proud of anything I've done. Bobby Joe Long, born Robert Joseph Long, was born on October 14, 1953 in Canova, West Virginia to parents Joe and Luella Long. His parents were married, but divorced when Bobby turned two years old. His father ended up moving away, and Bobby moved to Florida to live with his mother. His hate and resentment towards his mother started at a very early age because Bobby felt that his mother was more concerned with men than she was caring for him. Bobby's first traumatic experience happened at a beach in 1957. He went to the beach with his mother, and while she was preoccupied with talking to men, Bobby made his way into the ocean and almost drowned. The following year, in 1958, Bobby was riding a bicycle and crashed it into a parked car. He also suffered a head injury after falling off of a swing. A few years later, Bobby went pony riding, but ended up falling off of the pony and hitting his head once again. He experienced dizziness and nausea for weeks after that incident. Eventually, when Bobby started going to school, school was not an escape for him. He was struggling academically and had to repeat first grade. Along with the academic struggles, he also faced bullying because he was struggling with the effects of being born with a chromosomal disorder called Klinefelter syndrome. Instead of being born with an X and Y chromosome, Bobby was born with an extra X chromosome, making his genetic makeup XXY. Some of the more prominent symptoms of this condition are reduced muscle strength, less facial hair, less body hair, broader hips, enlarged breasts, small testicles, low testosterone, weak bones, cognitive deficits, infertility, and reduced sex drive. Men who have an extra X chromosome in only some of their cells, which would be called XXY mosaic, show milder symptoms than men who have an extra X chromosome in all of their cells. As for Bobby, since his body did not develop a lot of testosterone and his glands were producing large amounts of estrogen, he grew breasts when he started puberty and was bullied for it. Bobby was confused about his gender identity, and he felt that everything about his life was dysfunctional. His breasts grew so big that his mother was able to get him set up with getting a breast reduction surgery. Bobby's relationship with his mother continued to develop into a strange relationship. He co-slept with his bipolar mother, Luella, until the end of junior high, and even though he was close with his mother, his hatred and resentment towards women continued to grow like wildfire. Luella worked at a bar and would always wear skimpy outfits that Bobby was uncomfortable with. Even though Luella denied this, Bobby said that Luella would frequently bring men home to their one-bedroom apartment and he would endure having to see and hear some of their inappropriate encounters. Also in their one-bedroom apartment, Bobby and his mother had a dog. Not only was Bobby resenting his mother and women, but he was jealous of his own dog because he felt that the dog ate better food than he did. At the age of 13, 
Bobby got a hold of a handgun and killed his dog by shooting her in the vagina. When Bobby started high school, he met his first girlfriend, Cynthia, and it was only then that Bobby started sleeping by himself. Bobby married Cynthia when he turned 21 and the couple had two children together. Their marriage was volatile and things got worse after Bobby got into a motorcycle accident and injured his head. Bobby was hospitalized for weeks after his crash and Cynthia said things changed for the worse. He became short-tempered and ended up assaulting his family on a regular basis. Cynthia also claimed that his reduced sex drive switched to be compulsive and often. The type of sex also changed and it was more aggressive, more like a sexual sadist. Cynthia could not take it anymore and she finally filed for divorce in 1980. Bobby went to go live with a female friend by the name of Sharon Richards and she ended up calling authorities on him because she accused him of sexually assaulting her. Bobby was charged and convicted, but he was awarded a retrial in 1984 and was acquitted of all charges in that second trial. After receiving his new sentence and on his way out of the courtroom, he laughed in Sharon's face. A few years later, in 1983, Bobby was busted for sending inappropriate photographs and sex letters to a female and ended up spending time in jail, but his sentence was very short and he was put on probation. When Bobby was released from jail, the only thing on his mind was sex and he vowed to get it on his own terms. He scouted homes that had for sale signs on them and also hunted for women who were selling things on the classified ads. These women would give Bobby their home address in the hopes of him purchasing an item that they had posted on the classifieds, but instead he would force his way into their house and sexually assault the women. Some reports claim that he also placed ads in the classified section, pretending to sell appliances and would prey on the women who reached out to him. Bobby got away with sexually assaulting at least 50 women. He was never caught or arrested for these crimes. In March of 1984, Bobby took his crimes to another level when he met up with a prostitute by the name of Artis Wick. After sexually assaulting Artis, Bobby's rush and wants were no longer satisfied, so he made the decision to kill her. This was Bobby's first kill, and it gave him the rush he needed, so he would go on to commit many more murders. A couple of months later, in May of 1984, Bobby was driving around in Tampa, Florida, and saw a young woman by the name of Lena Long. Lena was a Loatian immigrant working as a stripper for the Sly Fox Lounge. Bobby would frequent that strip club, so he was familiar with who Lena was. Bobby slowed his car down next to where Lena was walking and offered her a ride. Lena agreed to get in Bobby's car. Bobby drove a bit and then parked on the side of the road and attempted to assault Lena, but she started screaming and fighting Bobby back. Eventually, Bobby was able to subdue Lena and he ended up driving to a more remote location where he sexually assaulted her and killed her. Lena's body was found face down a couple of days later, but police had no leads. The only thing they did notice was that her body was purposely posed in an awkward position. Her legs were spread so far apart from each other that the distance between the both of her heels were five feet. Bobby's third victim was 22-year-old Michelle Sims. Michelle was a prostitute, so had no issues getting into Bobby's car when he propositioned her for sex. A fourth victim by the name of Elizabeth Laudenbach was found dead 17 days after she was killed. Police did not think there was a connection to the previous murders because Elizabeth was not a drug user, nor was she a prostitute. She had all of her clothes on her when she was found, but they did find red nylon fiber on her body and it was the same red nylon fiber material that was found on Michelle Sims body. Bobby's next victim was another prostitute by the name of Chanel Williams. Chanel was an 18 year old working in the streets. It was the evening of September 30th, 1984 and Chanel was walking with another prostitute friend, but they split up after Bobby picked her up. Bobby sexually assaulted Chanel, but she was too strong and athletic for him to subdue and kill so he changed his M.O. and shot her two times in the neck. Her body was not found until the following month. The same exact day Chanel's body was found, Bobby killed a 28-year-old by the name of Beth Dinsfriend. Beth was a cocaine addict, and she was also a prostitute looking for a John. She found Bobby on the cross streets of Nebraska Avenue and Hillsborough Avenue. He did to her like he did many of his previous victims, sexually assaulted her, and then killed her. Shortly after killing Beth, Bobby killed his seventh victim, Kimberly Hopps. Kimberly was a 22-year-old prostitute, addicted to drugs, and was working in the streets the night Bobby picked her up and killed her. In November of 1984, Bobby was driving around in the Tampa area again, and he spotted a woman named Lisa McVeigh. 
Lisa was riding her bicycle home from her job at a local donut shop. Bobby forced Lisa into his car and made her perform a sexual act on him. When Lisa was finished with that act, Bobby decided not to kill her and instead brought her back to his apartment where he immediately sexually assaulted her again. Unlike Bobby's previous victims, Lisa's life was spared. Although her life was spared, she was not free to leave and she had to endure Bobby's sexual needs for over 24 hours. There was something in Lisa that prevented Bobby from killing her. He eventually let Lisa free. The only reason Lisa was set free was because she was begging for her life and came up with a lie that her father was very sick and she was the only one who could take care of him. She tried to gain sympathy from Bobby and it worked. Before he let her go, thinking that she would keep her mouth shut, he told her, tell your father he's the reason why I didn't kill you. Before getting arrested at a movie theater near his home in Tampa, Bobby killed Virginia Johnson and Kim Swan. Virginia was an 18-year-old prostitute whose body was discovered by a female ranch owner who was out riding one of her horses. Kim Swan was a 21-year-old stripper who worked at the Sly Fox Lounge just like Bobby's previous victim, Lena Long. When authorities searched Bobby's vehicle for any evidence or clues, they noticed that his car had red carpeting and the red fibers in the vehicle matched the red fibers that were found at the crime scene of some of his previous victims. After Bobby was arrested, authorities connected him to a tenth victim, the murder of Vicki Elliott. He was also wanted in three different Tampa Bay jurisdictions because other investigators had collected forensic evidence including ligatures, semen, clothing, and more. After Bobby's arrest on November 16th, Prosecutors worked hard to gather as much evidence as they could from all of the victims they thought were linked to him. The police gave prosecutors semen samples, fiber samples, and other vital pieces of information that would help in getting a conviction. Bobby signed a Miranda waiver and also agreed to be questioned. Initially during questioning, when detectives tried asking him questions about murders they suspected he was involved with, he responded by saying, I'd rather not answer that. The detectives were getting nowhere and Bobby was not forthcoming or helpful in providing them any information, so they decided to take things a step further by showing him photographs of different murder victims and leaving the room. Bobby was in the interrogation room alone with horrific images, and when the detectives returned to the room, he told them, the complexion of things sure have changed since you came back into the room. I think I might need an attorney. Detectives made no effort to provide Bobby with a lawyer, and the questioning continued. Bobby eventually confessed to killing eight women in Hillsborough County and one in Pasco County. Bobby was also quoted saying, When I saw them walking down the street, it was like A, B, C, D. I pull over, they get in, I drive a little ways, stop, pull a gun, whatever, tie them up, take them out, and that would be it. And they all went exactly the same until McVeigh came along. The FBI was able to analyze the fiber evidence given to them and they were also able to link Bobby's vehicle to most of the victims he admitted to killing. Bobby's trial began in 1985, and the Hillsborough County State Attorney's Office and the Public Defender's Office of Hillsborough County reached a plea bargain deal after Bobby agreed to plead guilty on September 24, 1985 to eight homicides and the crimes against one surviving victim, Lisa McVeigh. Bobby's victim, Artis Wick's body, was found after Bobby was arrested and gave a confession and pled guilty, so he was never charged with her murder. Bobby received 26 life sentences without the possibility of parole and seven life sentences with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Jurors, they should have been so upset. Bobby had two separate trials. He received the death penalty for the murder of Michelle Sims in his plea deal trial of him admitting to killing eight women. The state chose to seek the death penalty and he was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to death for the murder of Michelle Sims. Bobby's second trial was for the murder of Virginia Johnson out of Hillsborough County. In the agreement of Bobby's first trial, the state was not allowed to use the convictions obtained through the plea agreement, so his confession was thrown out and the trial went directly into the penalty phase and Bobby was found guilty and sentenced to death again. Now, Bobby had two death sentences hanging over his head. Bobby tried to appeal his first degree murder convictions and death sentence for the crimes he committed in Hillsborough County when he killed Virginia Johnson. His appeal was granted and Bobby's death sentence was vacated and with his conviction reversed, 
his case was set to go back to trial court with the orders of acquitting Bobby for the murder of Virginia Johnson. Now, Bobby's complete sentence was one five-year sentence, four 99-year sentences, 28 life sentences, and one death sentence. While spending his time on death row, Bobby accused the state office, whose job is to defend death row inmates, of revealing his private letters to authors which violated his attorney-client privilege. He also claimed that the state office was running a death pool by betting on dates which inmates would be executed. In Bobby's appeal, he asked for the state office to be removed from his case. There was an investigation, but the appeal court concluded that the allegations were unfounded. They also denied his motion for his public defender Bob Dillinger to be relinquished from having possession and control of his file. Fast forward to 2019, Bobby continued to have issues with his legal team. Bobby was originally set to die by method of electrocution, but decades had passed since his sentence was handed out and the state was now carrying out executions by method of lethal injection. On April 23, 2019, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed Bobby's death warrant from May 23, 2019, and it was the first death warrant he signed since he took office earlier that year. On May 3, 2019, the same month Bobby was set to be executed, he and his lawyer missed a court appearance and argued that he should not be executed because the method of lethal injection causes undue pain. He wanted to find a method to die that would be painless for him. That same day, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis denied Bobby's stay of execution. Lula Williams, who was the mother of one of Bobby's victims, Chanel Williams, attended the hearing that Bobby and his legal team missed. She spoke with the media and said, he inflicted pain on my daughter and the other victims, and he's worried about pain? It was now May 23, 2019, Bobby's execution day. He was taken out of his cell at around 9.30 in the morning for his last meal, which consisted of roast beef, bacon, french fries, and a soda. When it was time for his execution, he made no final words. But there were people in the witness stand who spoke to the media about why they wanted to be there to witness his death. Surviving victim Lisa McVeigh said, I wanted to be the first person he saw. Good evening, my name is Master Deputy Lisa Nolan. I have been with the Sheriff's Office 20 years. My current status, um, I'm in a school, a middle school, a school resource officer, um, and I proudly represent that division, community. Robert Frada was born on February 22, 1957, in Westbury, New York. Growing up, he was always one of the shortest and skinniest boys, so he was frequently made fun of. As he got older, in order to feel better about himself, he started working out and became more vain about his looks. In 1983, Robert began working as a public safety officer in Missouri City, Texas. Back in the day, in Missouri City, they cross-trained new prospects to be police officers and firefighters, so Robert was officially a police officer and firefighter. Robert had a good job, and he also met a good woman by the name of Farrah Bucker. Farrah was born in August of 1961 in England. According to Robert and Robert alone, Farrah was engaged to a man living in England when she decided to pursue him. He claimed that he was not even attracted to her because she was too short and too skinny. His dream was to have big, tall kids who would not be picked on like he was in school. He was attracted to big and tall women, but he believed Pharaoh was a sign from God, and he did not want to ignore God's sign. In the beginning, uh, what was funny was I, I wasn't very attracted to her physically. She wasn't my, she was only like five foot four and about 116 pounds when met. Well, I always liked bigger women because uh, I was always on the small side, but she was just, uh, she treated me wonderfully. And uh, she was already engaged to somebody from England, and yet she still kept pursuing me knowing I was dating other women. And I felt that as she was coming over to my apartment and as she'd want to cook for me, clean for me, do my clothes for me, I'm like, this woman's wonderful. So I, I kept praying to God, saying, is this the woman that you want me to marry? Because she, I mean, I, I grew to love her and, and fall in love with her for the, the personality that, that she was and, and based on the way she was treating me. So yeah. Farah was cooking and cleaning for Robert and treating him like a king. 
She had the perfect qualities of a wife, and that won him over. The couple eventually got married the same year he became an officer and fireman in 1983, and they had three children together, Bradley, Daniel, and Amber. Farah was a great mother who was always involved in interacting with her children in a positive way. While Farah was doing her best to be a good mother, Robert, who was obsessed with his looks, acted on his attraction to larger women. He would go on to have many affairs with obese women, and he also acted on his fetish of coprophilia. He loved to eat feces and drink urine and had no shame in admitting this or requesting this from his plus-sized lovers. After a while, Robert got comfortable and secure enough in his marriage that he ended up requesting Farah to defecate on him while they were intimate, and she shared this info with her close friends because it was something that made her uncomfortable. Robert also shared his desires with his friends because he didn't think anything was wrong with it. Aside from their sexual issues, Robert affected Farah on an emotional and physical level. For Farah, the sexual demands took her over the edge, and she decided to leave Robert. After Farah left, Robert kept complaining to others that Farah was not exciting enough for him in bed. He initially expressed that they could fix their marriage if Farah agreed to have an open relationship, but Farah would not agree to that. In March of 1992, Farah filed for divorce. The couple's divorce trial was scheduled for November 1994, and both Robert and Farah went under psychological evaluations so the courts could determine which parent was better suited to be deemed conservator of the children. Even though Robert initially did not want full custody of his children, he was asking for it because it was about control and winning over Farah. Farah was agreeing to an extended visitation schedule for Robert, but Robert wanted to restrict Farah's ability to change residences with the children to a within a 100-mile radius. Farah did not want a restriction on where she could move. Robert also wanted joint legal custody, and Farah wanted sole legal custody. Robert grew more angry with Farah for not submitting to his every want, and he was bitter towards her as well. He started to complain that he was always broke because child support was too expensive. Robert would also complain to his friends that he wanted Farah dead because Farah's parents had a lot of money and would support her financially for court proceedings. He also felt that she would win everything she was requesting. He frequently referred to her as a female dog, and in December of 1993, there was a deposition and Farah explained why the petition had been filed on the grounds of cruelty. Robert's history of assault on Farah and his sexual desires were coming to light. Robert told his friends that he did not appreciate the things Farah was mentioning in her petition, and he did not want her telling everyone intimate details about him. In the months leading up to the November 1994 trial, Farah was attacked by a masked man who used a stun gun on her while she was at her own house. There was an investigation, and many thought it was Robert who was the attacker or involved with the attack, but the investigation did not prove Robert had anything to do with it because witnesses let detectives know that Robert was at church with his children and could not have been the attacker. There was no evidence to tie Robert to the crime, and the investigation yielded no suspects. On Robert's end, he continued to focus on his looks and would regularly go to the gym. He was also dead set on finding someone to eliminate Farah from the world. He asked about seven people at his gym if they would be willing to kill Farah for him. He had no shame in asking and was confident enough to believe that they would not go to the cops even after they denied his request. One gym goer by the name of Mike Edens who refused to kill Farah was told by Robert, I'm going to find a way to knock her off. Robert then asked Mike if he knew someone else who would be willing to kill his estranged wife Farah. Robert spoke to another gym friend who also happened to be a police officer. This officer said that Robert told him, I would kill her and I would be out in five years and get my kids back and I wouldn't have to pay child support. All of Robert's friends and acquaintances would later go on to say that they thought Robert was just joking and blowing off steam. With the last officer friend not letting the force know about Robert's idle threats, Robert grew more arrogant and cocky. He was used to always being in control and the only part of his life that he did not have control over anymore was Farah. Robert told another police officer friend, I just ought to kill her, and I'll do my time, and when I get out, I'll have my kids. Robert did not fear prison at all. After months of asking different people to kill his wife, Robert finally found a man named Joseph Prystash, who agreed to help him kill Farah. Joseph then went home and enlisted the help of his 18-year-old neighbor, Howard Guidry. Robert came up with a plan that he would take his three children to church while the murder was carried out so that he would have an alibi. 
Although Joseph was not part of Robert's regular friend circle, in the weeks leading up to November 9, 1994, Robert was seen hanging out with Joseph around town and at Robert's gym. It was now November 9, 1994, three weeks before their scheduled court date was to start. Robert decided to put his plans into fruition. He picked his children up from school on a Wednesday afternoon on a scheduled visitation day, offered for Farah to come to the Wyatt's cafeteria to eat with him and the kids, and she agreed. After they ate, Farah went her own separate way while Robert took his kids to their Catholic church. The two youngest kids went to the church's nursery while the oldest child went to catechism class. While his kids were occupied, Robert attended a parents' meeting at the church. It was not abnormal for the children to attend their classes, but it was unusual for Robert to stay for the parents' meeting. While he was attending the meeting, though, he would frequently leave and then come back to the meeting. He was leaving so that he could attend to phone calls in the church's office. While this was happening, Farah was doing her own thing in her own car. She went to a beauty salon to get a haircut, and she left at about 7.45 p.m. It took her 15 minutes to get home, and she got to her house at 8 p.m., because she was expecting Robert to bring the kids back to her house. She opened her garage door and backed into her driveway. Little did she know that Howard had entered her house through the back gate and entered the garage through the side entrance. When Farah stepped out of her car, Howard shot her. He was about to flee, but he realized that she was still fighting to stay alive, so he shot her a second time, thinking he completed the job. Howard then ran to the getaway car Joseph was waiting in, and they drove off. Robert gave the men $3,000 for this job. Neighbors who lived across from Farah witnessed Farah falling to the ground, and they also witnessed one black man in a getaway car and another man dressed in all black. Farah's parents, Lex and Betty Becker, recounted how they felt when they heard what happened to their daughter. Lex said, I came home about 7 o'clock from work, and my wife had just prepared a nice hot meal for me. The telephone rang. It was maybe two minutes after 8 o'clock. On the other end of the line was Farah's neighbor, who delivered the unthinkable news. I don't know how fast I drove. I have no idea. And when we went there, the lights were all over the place, and the cops were trying to stop us. Betty said that police were trying to stop them from getting to Farah because although Howard thought he killed Farah with the second shot, in actuality, she was still clinging to life. Lex continued, I got to Farah and she was alive. She was face up, but she was having convulsions. She died soon after. I just put my hand up on her, just shut her eyes. Betty said, and I felt her. She was cold. It hurt so much. As for the officers at the scene, they noticed that Farah's purse had not been touched and her car was not taken, so they knew it was not a robbery or a carjacking. An hour and a half after the murder, Robert arrived at the house with his children with a nonchalant attitude. Officers thought his behavior and demeanor was odd. Officers noticed that he was not sad, surprised, or concerned. One officer was quoted saying, Robert seemed very confident, very composed, and well in command of the situation. Robert was questioned, and officers felt that he was not telling the truth. After searching Robert's car, they found a 9mm pistol, which was later determined not to be the murder weapon, and $1,000 in cash. Robert was detained in the homicide division at the police station and questioned by multiple detectives for 14 hours. Although they believed he caused his wife's death, they did not have probable cause to hold him, so they let him go. The very next day, Robert went to his gym's tanning salon. He was conversing with Howard and told him, If everybody keeps their mouth shut, everything will be alright. But if crap ever hits the fan, just tell them that you went over there to scare her and the first bullet you shot that went by her head actually grazed her, and then you got scared, and that's when you fired a second shot. Howard realized that Robert was trying to shift the investigation to him, but it wasn't until March 1995 that Harris County Sheriff Department investigator Danny Billingsley placed the focus of the investigation on Howard Guidry after he was arrested on March 1st for robbing a local bank. They found a 38 caliber pistol on him. A few days after Howard was arrested, a woman named Mary Gipp went to the sheriff's department and told an investigator that Howard had been involved in Farah's murder. They checked the pistol, and they found out that it was a pistol purchased by Robert back in 1982. Farah's father was able to identify the weapon as the gun Robert gave to him in 1993 for safekeeping, and he let cops know that Robert retrieved that gun in 1994.
Before things were coming together for detectives, a local news crew spoke with Robert, who was wearing blue jeans, a blue and yellow jacket, and he was equipped with a bum bag. He was more concerned about his looks than he was portraying to be a concerned husband. He licked his fingers and slicked his eyebrows down with his wet fingers. He told the media, I hope they find the guy soon. After several months of investigating, detectives spoke to church members who were there the night of November 9, 1994. They mentioned that although Robert was there that night, he was constantly on his phone. Robert's children also let detectives know that when their dad took the phone calls, he made them wait in the car by themselves. When detectives searched through Robert's phone records, they noticed that multiple calls were made to a Mary Gipp. When detectives initially tried speaking with Mary, she was uncooperative. When they did some more digging, they found out that her boyfriend was a Joseph Prystash and he was an ex-con who worked out with Robert at the same gym. They also let Mary know the seriousness of the situation because there was a murder involved. Mary then felt the need to open up because her phone was the one used for the murderers to communicate with each other. That is what made her go speak with a detective to let them know about Howard. She also let detectives know that her boyfriend took her phone without her knowledge. She became fully candid after being promised immunity. Mary said that her boyfriend Joseph was always communicating with Robert on the phone, and she even saw Joseph talking to the neighbor Howard a lot more. She said that on the evening Farrell was murdered, she came home from work and found Howard dressed in all black, sitting on the steps in front of her apartment. Joseph arrived a few minutes later, but they left for a short while. When Joseph returned to Mary's place later that night, Howard was still with him. Along with Mary's statements and statements that came from neighbors who witnessed parts of the murder offense, detectives also focused on phone records that showed exact times and locations of Robert, Joseph, and Howard during the time of the murder. All three men were eventually arrested, and Robert was arrested on April 21, 1995, based on Howard's confession. Robert was charged with hiring two men to kill his wife, and Joseph and Howard were charged with murder. When trial began, the prosecutors led with the motive of Robert being tired of the divorce battle and child support payments, and in order for everything to stop, Farrah needed to be killed. Despite initially admitting to being involved, and Joseph and Howard admitting to being involved in the murder, when trial began, Robert claimed that he was completely innocent. He was quoted saying, I'm completely innocent of my wife Farrah's death. Prosecutors painted a portrait of a narcissistic, self-centered, egotistical man. A Dr. Abrams testified that Robert suffered from antisocial personality disorder. He was also diagnosed as a narcissist who had extreme self-love and if his desires were not fulfilled, it would lead to intense anger. Dr. Abrams also testified that before becoming a police officer, Robert was denied a place in the police academy class after testing two times. On April 17, 1996, a jury found Robert guilty of capital murder and he was sentenced to death. On March 26, 1997, Howard was sentenced to death for shooting Farah. Joseph was also sentenced to death for the murder of Farah and for being the getaway driver. After seven years on death row and years of appeals being denied, finally, Robert and his legal team were able to get a response in their favor from the appeals court. Robert and his team were able to get his death conviction overturned when the appeals court ruled that the confessions from Howard and Joseph should not have been admitted into evidence because Robert's lawyers were not able to cross-examine them. September 26, 2003 was the official date the federal court overturned the conviction, and in January 2005, the appeals court upheld the reversal. A new judge ruled that the testimonies from Howard and Joseph should not have been admissible. Robert was then granted a new trial. At the conclusion of his new trial, he was still sentenced to death. While on death row, Robert has taken part in interviews, and to date, all of his appeals have been denied. One of his main focuses is dating, though. He has his own personal website dedicated to him, and he also has a dating profile on a website that matches inmates with suitors from the outside. The site says their goal is to make a difference in the lives of inmates serving prison terms. Robert's profile says that he is single, easygoing, and non-judgmental. He goes by Bobby on the site, and despite him previously saying that he was only attracted to plus-sized women, on his profile he says that he is open to any and all. Hi, I'm Bobby, and I'm looking for real friendships. Your age, sex, looks, marital status, nationality, 
race, and preferences don't matter to me. I don't play games, have a good sense of humor, and I am open to all topics. I'm also a good listener if you need someone to talk to or a shoulder to lean on. I'm here for you if you're tired of dealing with the superficiality of social media sites where many people get caught up with portraying themselves in an exaggerated manner and hopeless quests to meet someone else's ideals. If you're willing to disconnect from an electronic device long enough to explore the possibility of a rich, warm, intimate human experience, then write me. I want and accept you as you are. Let's have a relaxed friendship based on openness and honesty with equal reciprocity and meaningful exchange, and enjoy the wonderful rewards that come from it. While Robert was living it up on death row, this month and this year, October 2022, after spending 25 years on death row, he was given an execution date. 65-year-old Robert is now set to die on January 10th, 2023. Who knows if that date will change because of a stay of execution or if he will really be executed on that day. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know in the comments below if you guys think his execution truly will be carried out next year. Hello everyone, today's story is on Robert Charles Gleason Jr., who was the first person executed in the United States in the year 2013. But he spit at me. So then I lit him up. I told him what was going to happen. I was waiting for one of the house guys to come by with the barrel. See, at lunchtime, they come by with the barrel for your tray. I was trying to con one of them and, hey, turn your back. I need to get something out of the barrel, but he wouldn't do it. A barrel, but rigor mortis kicked in. Couldn't do it. Do I have remorse for this? No. Am I on a suicide mission? No. My thing is, I'm not throwing this out as a threat. It is what it is. If you guys give me life, sooner or later I have to go to population. I'm not Armstrong. I'll sign any kind of waiver you want beforehand, whatever's legal, saying I will not appeal this death penalty. Wash my hands with it. Send me to Sussex. But if I get life, I'll end up in population sooner or later. Someone's going to get it. Ain't going to be an inmate. I don't give a rat's ass when none went by. I ain't going to do it half ass like Lamont Douglas or the other clowns did. Now, you guys take that off. Wallens Ridge could have present, uh, prevented a death. My fault. It's my fault. The only remorse I have, my kids got to deal with their father being a scumbag. But since I got messed with, the only way to prevent me for fucking taking someone else out to get the death penalty. Do I deserve the death penalty? Damn right it is. Your law states premeditation, inmate killing. There's a lot more that's going to be said on this stand when it does go to trial. If it wasn't for my kids, I'd, I'd take Lonnie's deal. Lonnie says it's second degree with no time. You ain't sweeping this underneath there. And I do have contacts with my club through media, not the one that the Dean of Potter we're talking about. I was like, I want this to be known. It was premeditated. And you guys can do to me to hurt me. Nothing. But there's something you guys can do to prevent someone else from getting hurt. It's, your, it, it's on you. You know what I mean? It's on you guys. Put the death back on. Let the jury hear it and go with it. After that's over with, I'll be cuffed everywhere I go at Sussex. Leave me alone. I'm going to push this to go through all, right away. It might be a couple of years. But I can't guarantee nothing will happen to another, another staff member. That's my word. Take that for whatever you think it's worth. But a letter for this guy's family, you know what I mean, by, yeah, you guys may think he's crazy, but you know what, he couldn't help it. I did everything I could to not kill this man. But when he played games, I planned it. You know what I mean? Was I was taunting him, yeah, it's coming. All these rules you should have went by, it's coming, Holmes. I even gave him a cigarette, like, here you go, come Friday. Enjoy that, my I got no remorse for it. Zero. Let me ask you a question if you want to answer it and you don't have to. If you had a chance today to prevent the, another death, wouldn't you do it? You don't have to answer it, but if you'd, if you'd say no, I'd call you a liar. You know? Here's your chance for one death that shouldn't have happened. You have a chance to stop another one. I feel justice would be served for that man.
because that man shouldn't have been in, in my cell, no matter what he did in his past. Someone should have Robert helped. Charles Gleason Jr. was born on April 10, 1970. There is not a lot of information on his childhood, but some accounts say that growing up, Robert was in and out of mental health facilities. When he got older, he continued suffering from paranoia, anxiety, and depression. Despite his mental health struggles, he was still able to have relationships with women, and he fathered multiple children with these women as well. Patrick Hoffman, a friend of Robert's, said that he was a genuine nice guy and an all-around good person. Robert had worked as a tattoo artist for a while, and Patrick said that not only was Robert a great tattoo artist and friend, but he was a great father figure too. Patrick also said that Robert was never aggressive. Amy Taylor, the mother of one of Robert's children, said that Robert was very fun, loving, and compassionate. Despite kind things being said by many people, Robert was not how others portrayed him. He had ties to the gang world and had killed multiple people and got away with it. Early in 2007, Robert was dabbling in the meth drug trade ring and his movements were being observed by federal investigators. In order to prevent someone from snitching on him, he killed truck driver Michael Kent Jamerson on May 8, 2007. On May 9, 2007, the day after Michael was killed, a turkey hunter found his body. A few days later, a Liberty University student was fishing along the bank of the James River and they found a gun. The gun was found three miles away from where Michael's body was found. Evidence traced back to Robert and he was arrested. His trial did not begin until 2008, but during his trial, he admitted to killing Michael. He said that he had stopped by a wooded area in Amherst County and he pulled the gun used to kill Michael from Michael's own belt. After grabbing the gun, Robert told Michael to get right with God and then he started shooting him multiple times. For this crime, Robert was sentenced to life in prison at the Wallens Ridge State Prison. The following year in 2009, Robert was cellmates with a Harvey Gray Watson. Harvey, who was born on September 11, 1945, was serving a 100-year sentence for a shooting spree that took place on August 11, 1983. His shooting spree resulted in him killing one person and injuring three more. Robert believed Harvey was severely mentally ill and he demanded to be moved to another cell. His request fell on deaf ears because his request was never granted and he continued living with Harvey as a cellmate. Harvey did have known mental health issues though. He was known for singing loud and obnoxious made-up songs throughout the night and would even drink his own urine. Day by day, Robert grew angrier. Robert could no longer take it, and on May 8, 2007, the second anniversary of when he killed Michael Jamerson, Robert killed his 63-year-old cellmate Harvey Watson. The two had only been cellmates for a week. Robert kept quiet, got some sleep, and guards did not find Harvey's body until about 15 hours after he had died. Robert had no issues admitting to his crime against Harvey, and he pled guilty to murder. His case grew a lot of media attention, and in court, he asked to be sentenced to death because he knew he would kill again. He said it was not Harvey's fault that he died, but the prison's because they knew he was a killer and would continue killing. He also admitted to killing more people before Michael Jamerson, but had just never been busted for those murders. He claimed that some kills were for money and others were because people just made him angry. Robert was found guilty of killing Harvey, but while waiting for his sentence, he was sent to a highly secure prison for Virginia's most dangerous inmates at Red Onion State Prison. Despite being at a supermax prison with surveillance cameras everywhere, Robert made it his mission to prove his point and kill again. It was July 28, 2010, and Robert, along with other inmates, were sent to the recreation yard. Inmates were all separated by a chain link fence. In the cage next to Robert's, there was a 26-year-old convicted carjacker by the name of Aaron Cooper who was serving a 34-year sentence at Red Onion. Robert ripped and braided bed sheets and brought it with him to his cage. Next thing you know, Robert used the bed sheets to try and kill Aaron. Robert fit his hands and the bed sheet through the fence, and it took him over one hour on and off to finish Aaron off. Aaron's oxygen supply was cut on and off multiple times. Finally, after the hour was over and Aaron was officially dead, guards miraculously saw a body lying on the ground from the surveillance cameras so they ran to the rec yard and tried giving Aaron CPR. Robert began mocking the guards and was quoted saying, you're going to have to pump a lot harder than that.
Although during trial, Robert was deemed to have been suffering from depression and impulsive behavior, he was still deemed competent and knew right from wrong. Robert ultimately received two death sentences. He said in phone interviews that he deserved to die for what he did. He was quoted saying, The death part don't bother me. This has been a long time coming. I wasn't there as a father, and I'm hoping that I can do one last good thing. Hopefully this is a good thing. While on death row, Robert continued to request death because he kept a promise to his loved ones that he wouldn't kill again, and the only way to fulfill the promise was for him to die himself. He also claimed that his death will teach his children what could happen if they follow in his footsteps. A Virginia Attorney General filed with the Virginia Supreme Court and wrote, Killing to Robert is no different than going to the fridge to get a beer or tying a shoe, and he repeatedly made clear that he would continue to kill unless he received a death sentence. There was no need to fight, though, because Robert refused to appeal his death sentences and told his attorneys not to oppose his execution. When it was nearing Robert's January 16, 2013 execution, his sister Barbara said that she had mixed feelings about his execution because she loved him, but she didn't want him to be able to kill more people. In the state of Virginia, they do not allow inmates' families to witness their executions, so Barbara nor any of Robert's relatives were able to witness his execution. On Robert's execution day, there were last-minute appeals that were all rejected by the governor and the U.S. Supreme Court. None of the appeals were from Robert, though. People went against his wishes, and there was a whole team of capital defense attorneys trying to claim that Robert was mentally incompetent and his wish to die should not be granted. A prison guard was on standby with a red phone in his hand that was a direct line to the governor's office. There was never any intervention to delay his execution, and at 9 o'clock at night, the guard gave the okay for the executioner to begin the execution. I would also like to briefly mention that in 1995, Virginia gave death row inmates the option to choose their method of execution, either electrocution or lethal injection. By 2013, 85 inmates had been executed in Virginia, and only 6 out of those 85 inmates chose to be executed by method of electrocution rather than lethal injection. Robert chose electrocution. Robert walked into the execution chamber and smiled at all of the witnesses and winked at his spiritual advisor. One of the witnesses was his victim Aaron Cooper's mother, Kim Strickland. He then gave the crowd a thumbs up and sat in the wooden chair. He was wearing flip-flops, a blue shirt, dark blue pants with the right pant leg cut off at the knee, a skull cap, and a brine-soaked sea sponge that was strapped to his right calf. Robert then made his final statement. Well, I hope Percy ain't going to wet the sponge. Put me on the highway to Jackson and call my Irish buddies. Pogmo Foyn. God bless. After making his final statement, they covered his eyes and mouth, but there were holes for him to breathe out of his nose. There was a key on the wall that was turned to activate the system, and another execution member, who was behind a one-way window, pressed the actual execution button. The first cycle of electricity lasted for 20 seconds, the second cycle lasted 60 seconds, the third cycle lasted 90 seconds, and after 8 minutes, Robert was pronounced dead. Kim Strickland, victim Aaron Cooper's mother who witnessed the execution, sued Red Onion State Prison over Aaron's death. She was quoted saying, May God have mercy on his soul. I've been praying and will continue to pray that his family can heal from this ordeal. While Robert was on death row, Kim had actually received a letter from Robert describing Aaron's death. In the letter, he also wrote, Everyone will be okay if I get the death penalty. He finished off by saying he was going to keep her address. Kim lived in fear, knowing that someone had given Robert her address. She moved multiple times in hopes that Robert would never find out where she lived again and harm her. Back during Robert's sentencing hearing, she actually told the court that she was scared. A very reliable source told me I was not safe and I have moved four or five times. I have no sense of home anymore. Kim continued living in fear and did not have any stability. She did witness Robert's execution, but the instability caused her to become broke and she ended up living out of her car and shelters. If a death row inmate makes you feel unsafe and knows where you live, do you think the government should automatically put the victim in witness protection? Also, do you think the prison should have given her a payout for her son's death, or do you feel as if he was a criminal and those are the chances and or possibilities that might happen if you are a prisoner? Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below.